Shall we open our Bible to Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12 tonight? And we're going to take a look at refusing to share. Uh, once again, the Pharisees are being dealt with. We took a look at, and really, in all looking at context, really, chapter 11 all the way through chapter 12, verse 12, should be connected because it talks about, you remember, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrins, and so on. And Jesus is now beginning to answer a question. They said, well, ask, at, we want to ask you a question. And Jesus said, I'll answer the question if you answer me a question. And he said, well, was John's baptism from God or not? And so they knew that they had had it, the uh, Pharisees. But when you get into chapters 1 through 12 of chapter 12 of Mark, it really continues the story, and you begin to realize that Jesus now is speaking again to the Pharisees, the Sanhedrins, and he's talking really about refusing to share what God has given to them. They were to be the vineyard. They were to be the fruit that comes forth. They were to be something that God would honor, and they had been blessed by God. They had been a nation chosen by God, and yet all they had to do was abide in Christ and enjoy the fruit of the Spirit, but they didn't. They took things to themselves, and they became dead inside. And so when it came time for the fig tree, you remember, Jesus went there. The leaves were there, but there was no fruit. Symbolic of a religious life. There's nothing inside. It's dead. And so we are contrary to the religious life. In other words, more people have died under religion than anything else. We believe in relationship, not religion. And so when he comes now to this story about the parable, again, he's talking about there's no heart, there's no desire. And so we have this incredible story and kind of interesting. You kind of come to minister, help, and then you're turned on in a very horrible way. And how did he respond? That's how I want to look at this whole situation tonight. It says in Mark chapter 12, verse 1, he says, He began to speak unto them by parable, A certain man planted a vineyard, and set a hedge about it, and dug a place for the wine fat, and built a tower, let it out to the husband, and went into a far country. So there's the story. At the season he sent to the husband a servant that he might receive from the husband, the fruit of the vineyard. They caught him, beat him, sent him away empty. Again he sent them again another servant. At his, they cast stones at him and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. Again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others beat the same way and killed many others. So he's talking about God sent the prophets, and he sent the teachers. He sent certain people, but they continued to kill. And finally we read in verse 6, Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son, which is Jesus Christ. But the husband said, Hey, among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. They took him, they killed him, they cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandman and will give the vineyard unto the Gentiles, to us. Have you not read the scripture? The stone which the builder has rejected is become the head of the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. They sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that they had spoken the parable against them. They left him and went their way. And so in verse 12, it tells us that they knew exactly what Jesus was doing. He was going after them. The parable was about the Pharisees and the scribes. They had been given this incredible opportunity to shine for the glory of God. And Jesus Christ would be the landowner. They were now going to occupy it, and all they had to do was bear fruit. And the reason why he came back is according to uh, the rules of that land. If you were a landowner, you would have to come once a year. You would have to gather some type of crop. Otherwise, you would lose legal possession. So this is a very common thing. So Christ is now going to send these people, the prophets, and they just drove them away. 
And the reason why is that they could drive these people away, then the vineyard would become theirs and not God's. Finally, God sent his son, and they rejected him. They crucified him. Finally, we realized that God took it away from the Jews, blinded their eyes, given it to those who will now receive him, and that kind of is the whole story. So the question, I guess, really tonight is, what would you do if that happened to you? Here you are now trying to help somebody, encourage somebody, and all of a sudden they are now taking advantage of you. Or you are going to minister to somebody and you're really trying to help them, and they turn on you in a very horrible way. How would you react? Well, no doubt, we just cut them off. But it's interesting to me that Jesus sent one, two, three servants. Again, just the grace of God. Finally, he sent his very best, his only son. So the story, you cannot miss it. It's God's incredible love that he'll never give up on you. He'll never let you go, never let you go too far. And so very simply, it's the vineyard, so the landowner. And so we see it's God himself in verse 1. And so the landowner, God himself, his vineyard. He began to speak unto them by a parable, which means something that's going to be easy to understand. A certain man planted a vineyard, that would be God, planted the nation of Israel for one reason, to bear forth fruit, as set a hedge about it, dug a place for the wine fat, built a tower, and let it out to the husbandman, and went into a far country. Now, notice number one, they didn't do anything. It was the nation of Israel that God ordained, and God blessed it, and God did so many things. Notice who's going to maintain it. It says here, he set a hedge about it. He did it. He dug a place for the wine fat. He built a tower. He let it out, and once again, on a rent issue. So he was the one who established a nation. He's the one that has to sustain a nation. He's the one that created marriage. He's the one that has to maintain a marriage. If God wanted you to get married and you are married, then God has to be the grace and the stability of your life. You cannot do it by yourself. But God wants you to understand it's Him. He'll build the hedge. He'll give you the victory. He'll give you the strength. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song, my beloved touching his vineyard. And so this is what... Israel was to be. They were to be a vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard, a very fruitful hill. He fenced it. He gathered out the stones thereof. He planted it with a choice vine and built a tower in the midst of it. He made a winepress therein. He looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Now, check it out. He takes this beautiful piece of property. He levels it. He takes the rocks out, he cultivates it, he builds it, he does everything, and here their response is, well, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get wild grapes. Well, now, wait a second. What happened to the good grapes? Because their hearts were wicked. Verse 3 in Isaiah chapter 5. Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, O men of Judah, judge, I pray ye, betwitch me and my vineyard. What could I have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done? What could have been done more? Nothing. I mean, you've done everything, God, in our life. And he goes on, Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. Now go to, I tell you, what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof. It shall be eaten up, break down the walls thereof, and it shall be trodden down. I will lay it to waste. It shall not be pruned nor dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no water upon it. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. There it is. And the man of Judah, his pleasant plant. He looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. And so there you have it. He's saying that the children of Israel, I have blessed you. I took you out of poverty. I placed you upon this incredible rock. I've given you everything. What more could I have done? And yet we find ourselves heading towards sin. We find ourselves going towards the things that are not pleasing to God. We know that God has delivered us, but we go back to those things again. We know we're not to lust, but we do. We know we're not to be greedy, but we are. We know that we're not to get involved in certain things, but we do. And we know we're not to get angry, but we are. 
So what's the problem here? Did God plant you? He did. Did God hedge you? He did. So what is the thing that God's going to do? He says, I'll take it away. I'll let it down. I'll dry your life out. In other words, if I don't get what I need, then the ax is going to be put to the root because it's going to be taken away and it's going to be thrown away. I need to get fruit out of your life. Well, you say, well, Steve, I, I don't have any to give. That's because you're not abiding in Christ. If you abide in the vine, then you're going to be able to produce. If you are living by the water, your leaves are never going to be weary or they're never going to be dried and you're going to have fruit all the time. So it doesn't make a difference where you are in your life or what you go through in your life. It's who you're connected to down deep. Now, if I have a clock and I plug it in, unplug it, plug it in, unplug it, plug it in, unplug it, it's never going to keep the right time. In other words, because I keep messing with the plug, because I'm in fellowship, out of fellowship, in fellowship, out of fellowship, my whole life is now out of harmony with God. I need to plug it in and leave it alone. And I need to learn that this is where God wants me to live, no place else. But I get in the vine, and then I look out, and I say, well, man, look over here. And so I jump out, and I die, and I jump back in, and I live. You would think that sooner or later we kind of get the hint, stay in the vine, hang out with the Lord. But we don't, because we always think there's something better. And so he says here in verse 6, I will lay it to waste. In verse 7, this is the Lord's doing, because this is his house. And then in Psalm 80, verse 12, Why hast thou broken down her hedge, so that all they that pass by the way will pluck at her? That bore out the wood does waste it, and he, the wild beast of the field does destroy it. In other words, God, why are you doing this? Why is that life wasted? Well, first of all, God did everything, but I produced wild fruit. In other words, Hosea went out and grabbed his wife, but she went back to being a prostitute. It's only God that can get a hold of your heart. You can have a great marriage, but you can mess it up. You can have a great life and mess it up. You can have a great beginning, but mess it up. And Satan will always be there to try to cause you to sin. When you begin to get famous or whatever it might be, you're going to be attacked. When you get a raise, you're going to get attacked. When you begin to find that God's using you, you're going to get attacked. What are you going to do? You have to stay connected to the vine. So here, the landlord is the vineyard. He's the one that owns it. He owns your life. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price, therefore, what? Glorify God. I am to yield my members as unto instruments of righteousness, not into unrighteousness. So my mouth, my ears, my mind, my heart are to be given to the things of God. And that's my choice. And if I choose not to do that, then when God comes to receive the fruit, it's not going to be 30, 60, 100 fold. I'm going to be empty. And he's going to take it away and give to somebody else. Because God knows there's people hungry. And so the vineyard. But the second is the tendons. Notice the people that God placed in there. Israel would be his people. Israel would be the nation of Israel. And notice in verse 2 and 3 of Mark chapter 12. At the season he sent to the husband a servant that he might receive from the husband of the fruit of the vineyard. They caught him, they beat him, and sent him away empty. Now you can look at this any way you want. In other words, when people come into your life, how do you treat them? You can hold on to the parable and say, well, it's talking about the nation of Israel. Oh, it is. It's talking about prophets coming and ministering like Micah or Isaiah. They took him. They sawed him asunder. It's true. Or like, again, the prophets, they destroyed them. They dashed their brains out. They crucified them. They did. But when it comes to my life, what do I do when someone comes to try to share with me or try to help me or try to help me grow in the Lord? Right or wrong, how do I treat them? How do I send them away? What is the heart of my whole life? How am I receiving the people that come into my life? And that's important because we look at only perfect people coming into your life. Well, you shouldn't have got married to her. She's not perfect, and he's not perfect, and you shouldn't come to the church because it's not perfect. But God brings people who are imperfect into your life to drive you crazy, to try to help you. So how do you treat those people? What an idiot. He's so stupid. 
Now, wait a second. Who sent them? God. Why are you treating God's servant that way? He's not God's servant. He's kind of dingling. No. He's a dingling sent by God for you. You're the dingling. Because you don't have enough sense in your brain to realize that God's in this whole thing. Like David said when he walked out of the kingdom and Job wanted to kill, uh, you know, uh, um, what's his name? <laughs> Who was that guy? Anyway, I'll remember in a second. But Job said, can I kill him? And David said, how do I know that God didn't send him? How do I know? Here's the guy spitting on David. How do I know that God didn't send him to spit on me? Or how do I know that God didn't send him to curse me because of my lifestyle? Simei. So all of a sudden you begin to realize, do you pass that test? Or how about your husband coming home in a bad mood? Did you pass the test? No. You sent him back out, make him come back in. Well, maybe God brought him home that way just for you. To kind of help you. Kind of give you a little bit more patience. Well, Steve, I don't need any more patience. He needs to change. Well, why did he come home? See, when you start playing this game, like, you have to figure this thing out. You know, everything comes into your life for a reason, even all those kids you have. And so what can I say? And so number one, verse two and three. Number two, verse four, again he sent unto them another servant. Well, (laughs) I'm going to make sure this guy don't come back. And they stoned him and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. Now, am I throwing stones at people? Am I cursing people? Am I mad at people? Do I treat people right in the parking lot? Am I rude in the shopping mall? Am I ripping off parking stalls? Some people that shouldn't, you know, they were there first. What are you doing? Well, those are things that God sees. He sent them. And then in verse 5, again he sent another. Him they killed, and many others they beat the same and killed some. Now, what type of an attitude, what type of a reputation do I have as a person? Well, I'm a minister, but how many bodies do you have left over? Well, I just love God. I love to worship. How many people have you slain with your tongue? Well, I just love my wife. How many women have you lusted after? You see, when you look at this, you realize, God, what am I doing with what you send into my life? Am I really honoring that? Why did you send them? What is the purpose? Why do I have this adversary? Why did I get a flat tire? God, what is going on? And you can question everything, or you can just enjoy and trust God with all your heart. Finally, it said in verse 6 through 9, they took his son, and yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also, the last unto them, saying, they will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. That's all they wanted. They just wanted the vineyard. They did not want to give it back to God. They did not want to honor God. They wanted the vineyard. That's all they wanted. Kill him, and the inheritance is ours. They took him. They killed him. They cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore, pointing him back, the Lord of the vineyard do? What would you do? If you were God and you sent all these people into your life, and to other people's life, and they didn't want to listen. And then you sent one person, the person really respected, now they really want to listen. What about all the janitors you sent? And, well, they're not important. What? No way, time out. You see, God brings people into your lives for a reason. That's why when you go to Home Depot, or you go to wherever you might go shopping, or where you begin to do certain things, you have to treat people as they are the servants of the Most High God. And that means that you're going to have to mature and grow up and realize that when things happen to you, they happen for a reason. Because either you're boasting because you're really great, or God wants to push a button to show you that you're really not trusting Him. Or when you think that you've mastered what it is to love, then God is going to push that button with the kid, and that kid's going to drive you out of your mind. And all of a sudden, you're going to realize, God, help me. And so we realize the tendons. They failed to do it. And because they failed to do it, because they did not have the light, and that's all that God wanted them to do. He just wanted them to shine for the glory of God. He said, I'll build everything. But they took it upon themselves to begin to connive people. He said, I'll build everything. All I need you to do is shine. Did they shine? No. They stood on the corner and said, look it, we are the Pharisees. We're going to want to be worshipped. 
and they did not shine for God. They were not a witness for God. So God took it away from them and gave it to the Gentiles. Now, we rejoice because he went to the highway, the byways. Now the question is, are we shining for Jesus Christ? I don't know. I look, Brazil, there's revival. I see the third world, there's revival. I see every place in the third world, revival is happening. But here in America, it's not really happening. So are we like Israel? Have we shunned the warnings of God? Have we said no to the first one came? Maybe that one came, you need to pray more. Well, I don't need to pray more. You need to go to church more. I don't have to go to church more. Second. The third, you need to make a commitment. I don't need to make a commitment. The fourth, Jesus is calling you. You say, I don't need to do that. Well, then I'll tell you what. How are you going to shine? Because obedience is everything we have. And when all of a sudden I begin to be obedient to the things that God's given to me, I'll shine for the glory of God. Like Esther. She shined for the glory of God. God was able to use her because she shined. When it was time for her the queen before her, Vestai, to shine, she decided not to come when the king called her. The king said, I want you to come and shine. And she said, no, I'm too busy doing my own thing. And it absolutely fried the king. So he got rid of her. And for a whole year, he looked for another queen. And here was Esther, according to Mal- Malachi, Mordecai, dipping in oil, soaking in oil every single day. And when she stood before everybody, she shined. And she just stood out. And that was the one that God was going to choose. He had no business, no knowledge that she was a Jew, but she shined. And when it came to the moment that she had to stand up, she stood up. That's what God wants. And the question is, are we going to stand up? Are we going to shine? And if not, he's going to take it away from us and give it to somebody else. And that's the frightening thing you begin to look at. And then the harvest. There's always a harvest. Notice in Mark chapter 12, verse 9. He says, what shall there for the Lord of the vineyard do. He will come and destroy the husbandman and will give the vineyard to others. Have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builder rejected is become the head of the cornerstone. And so you know the story. They couldn't find the cornerstone. They threw it away. They did something else, but it was the cornerstone. It was Christ. Upon this foundation I'll build my rock. And he became a stumbling block to the Jews and a, a tremendous bummer for everything else but to us came the power of God and this was the Lord's doing it is marvelous in our eyes well of course it is God you've chosen me well Stephen I know I know I chose you but are you shining well yeah I think so really how's the fruit doing I don't know I got one two grapes what you know they're my grapes I don't don't touch them it says, jo- Joseph, his grapes went over the walls. Are you, would you say tonight that if we would look at your life, that you're one of these hundred fruit bearers you're just bubbling over? Like John the Baptist, we be held to be found in his glory because you just have so many grapes and just so much love and so much joy and we just got to have you over our house because you are the happening thing in Christianity. Or would you say you just got one grape? Just kind of a little sourpuss, you know, just say, get away from me. Don't judge my heart. Don't look at me. I don't have to smile. Well, what happened? That, you're going you're gonna to lose that one grape. Give it away. I can't give it away. Give it away. You can't. God will give you 100. So am I bearing fruit? Well, what do you mean am I bearing fruit? Okay, how simple do you want me to get? Are you loving your wife in spite of who she is? No. Are you going after the kids in spite of what they do to you? No. Are you sharing Christ with the world that's going to hell? No. Are you praying for anybody? No. Well, then I don't think you have any fruit. So the ax is right there. Well, why is that? Because other things are more important. What could be more important than you giving back to God what's his? And so you go to bed at night and you feel guilty. Why? Because you know that you have not produced. And if God gives you and God provides for you and God has blessed you and God has fulfilled and God's kept you working and God's done all these things and I can't give, then that is the absence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that the, the 
the blood of Jesus Christ and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and out of your belly is going to come forth torrents of living water and you're not going to stop it. You're going to just absolutely baptize people when they see you. And they're going to remember who you are because of how gracious you are to them. And so can you stay? Can you minister? Can you help? Oh, I'm just so tired. I'm so exhausted. Everybody's tired. Everyone's exhausted. Everyone's afraid. But how are you different? They have no fruit. We have the fruit. They have the fruit of the flesh. We have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. They get uptight. We don't. They go crazy. We don't. Why? Because we're bearing 30, 60, 100 fold. We are into this thing because we're abiding in Christ. Very powerful. Turn with me to John chapter 15 as we close tonight and before we take communion tonight. And John chapter 15 he mentions this in a very profound way. Just a great, great passage here in the Scriptures. He goes on to declare in John chapter 15, and this is God's will for your life. He says here, I am the true vine, John chapter 15, verse 1, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it might bring forth more fruit. So that's why God's working in your heart. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. So you're not going to do it by yourself, except it abides in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branch. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch is withered. And that's where we are, withered. As a man gathereth them, cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my word abides in you, ye shall ask whatever you desire, and it shall be done." Where herein is my Father glorified. Now how is he glorified? That ye bear much fruit. Ye shall, ye, so shall ye uh, be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, ye have I loved you. In verse 10, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in me. And even as I have kept my Father's commandments, he will abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be fulfilled, that ye keep my commandments. And so there he is. He's saying, I'm the vine, you're the branch. And the whole problem of Christianity is that I'm not tuned in. I'm not plugged in. I'm unplugged, plugged in, plugged in, plugged out. You've got to stay plugged in. And what Paul, what what here what Mark is saying is that these Pharisees, these Sanhedrins, all these people are these, a parable about them, that they missed it because very simply they did not understand what it was to be in Christ. They had a religion, but they did not have a relationship. They did not have the ability to produce fruit. All they produced was the flesh, anger, uptightness, cursing, swearing, yelling, screaming. They had nothing to do with the fruit of the Spirit. So somewhere along the line, God has to get a hold of my heart and say, Stephen, I gave this vineyard to the nation of Israel. They blew it. They did not shine for my glory. So I took it from them. I gave it to the Gentiles. Now they need to shine. So the commandment from God for me tonight is, Stephen, you have to have the salt and you have to have the light, and your whole life is for glorying God, giving God the glory, and that's shining for his kingdom. So tonight as we partake of communion, I really want you to think about that. Are you abiding in him? Are you fellowshipping with him? Well, why do I have to read my Bible? Because the joy of Christ will come into your heart. If not, you're going to wither up. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, but he that is planted by the rivers of water, he'll never want. He'll never wither. He'll always be in season, always be ready to minister. God, give us that grace to be there.